Okay, we got it. Recording. Let's clap okay, it in. Clap. Three, two, one. Three, two, and that was perfect timing. Fucking read all about up. it. Read all about it. Philadelphia Inquirer. There he goes. And the L.A. Times come together to present the Sunday Papers. Oh yeah. Huh. This sounds low. Are you okay? Hold on. Oh. Uh, not to any other human or dog within uh, here listening. I sounded low. Check, That's check, crazy. Check, check. No, my headphones. It's my headphones. They don't. Sound I think good. it's daylight savings time. It's in your head. Happy daylight savings time, everybody. Remember, you lost an hour. You lost an hour, and here's the thing that thank I've God decided for that these days. I've decided to lose masturbating. That's Whoa. twelve minutes, and now I got forty-eight other minutes I need to get rid of. So, uh, New York Times sent an alert or whatever the hell it is um, that. The pros and cons, you know, we're close to losing this daylight savings. Yes. But they, they, there were interesting arguments on both sides, of which I, I probably won't remember a lot of them. But, uh, but, you know, kids would be going to school in the dark. That is for sure. Yeah. And, well, uh, the other movement, though, depressing. is to make school start later. They're saying that kids are not getting enough sleep. And uh, I, is it weird that as a 56-year-old, I sleep more than a 9-year-old? <laughs> Is that a sign of depression or just that I really enjoy my mattress? Uh, no, no, you can't escape the, the guaranteed depression. I, when I get depressed, I look forward to sleep like an alcoholic looks forward to a drink. I just, I just, it's like I put on my eye mask, I take a sleeping pill, I put in my earplugs, I put a pillow over my head, I call it a mini suicide. And I just go out. I get to leave this unholy, painful world. Put an eye mask on, a little belt around my neck, lean up against the door. <laughs> and then I have the wherewithal. I just don't put the belt on the door. Now. That's the only, it's the only difference. And I, and I sleep like a baby, knowing I, I'm I that close. I did not sleep. I, li I'm in, uh, I, live. I live in Philadelphia this weekend. My favorite I'm city. I know, and believe me, when people come out and they buy my pins, which they do at this fucking club, I All sell right, so these pins. so it's a pins. bright group, okay. <laughs> and they all mention you. They all go, fuck Gibbons. Gibbons doesn't know shit. We have a, Phil we have a Philadelphia story coming up. I, I put it in. I put in yeah. a lot of the stories this week. I noticed that. I noticed that. Um <sighs> Well, but, God bless Philly. It's a beautiful city. I've never not said that. I've never said it's not a beautiful city. Maybe yeah. That's, I don't know my terms, but it's the people. I just don't like the people. <laughs> They're fucking animals. They're animals from a Why? New Yorker. Why? Just because they have to They're grease animals. up the poles when they win a championship? Huh? Just because they have to grease up the light poles when they have a championship? Literally animals. <laughs> Like, I didn't, was that true? You guys said that this week. Yeah, I don't even know that, true. and I hate Philly. Yeah. Um, they <laughs> greased the poles, and uh, they there was a video of a bunch of them on top of a bus stop jumping up and down, and then about 50 people fell on top of each other. They're disgusting. You know, they should grease the pole. You know what? They should, instead of greasing it, they should put like adhesive, almost like like those fly. They should. The city should hang fly traps to catch all these animals. Just get these fucking Philly. What's a nickname? Like you know, what what's the way to say mass hole in Philly? Uh, Philadelphia's. What? Philadelphia. Are you making that up? Yeah. It's terrible. No, there has to be something way, way more damning. Anyway, see all these Philly assholes stuck on flypaper all over town. Yeah, that's good. I like yeah. that. I like, I like that. that image a lot. Um, but I did. Uh, I flew in. It's the worst. The worst is you fly across the country. Uh, I, I get in on Thursday. I do a show that night. And then you can't sleep because you're on a different time zone. And then I have to wake up at 6.30 in the morning to go do local radio, which is 3.30 a.m. L.A. time. Mm -hmm. And then I come back to the hotel, spank one out, nap for a couple <sighs> hours. I wake up at 2.30 in the afternoon. I don't know what city I'm in. I'm nauseous. I'm dizzy. I'm disoriented. It takes me like three hours to get my head together to do another show. Uh, oh, it's so fucking, I, I, it used to be easy when I was young, but I, it's getting harder to do this shit as I get older. 
I know. You don't know where you wake up. There's tissues all over the place. <laughs> it's disgusting. The and maid like, is staring at me because I forgot to put the do not disturb sign up. Like, what coast am I on? What even time zone? I don't understand. <laughs> all right. Let me just fire up Pornhub again. <laughs> they, it's comforting. Uh, Although I got to do Preston and Steve, which is uh, maybe my favorite radio show in the country, besides Sunday Papers. Are they uh, they're they're Philly like Morning Drive or what? Yeah, they're huge. I mean, it's it's a it's a huge media market, and then I think they're number one in the market. And, wow! Uh, I've been go I've been going in there for fifteen years, and I got to be really close to them. So that's always fun. And then uh, John DeBello, who's another radio guy who I did this week, who I also love. Uh, he took me out to breakfast after after I did radio. Took me oh, to this great. Jewish deli. But um You get to talk about all their losing sports teams. So close. So close. So close. That's what they should call themselves, the so closes. Yeah. Um so uh by the way, I'm I was distracted. I turned off the TV, but I've been watching my cousin, Denny McCarthy, who is playing who's a pro golfer who is in the right now, the uh what's the tournament that's going on right now? The players. And he was in second place when I just turned off the TV. So huh. he's on fire. He had five birdies in the first seven holes. And, uh, yeah, so let's let's pull for Denny McCarthy. Wow, yeah. I uh, I might even – I've never watched golf, really. Uh, but I'll, I'll watch – yeah, you were updating it. And he's he has to be the hottest golfer literally today in that tournament coming out of the gate like that. Yeah, I think for the day's score, he's up there. He's up there. Uh the, the Shuff, Scotty Scheffler is, uh, I think, leading. He's 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 also, I think, five under for the day. Um, so let's let's thank uh, Craig Godet who did our Sunday Papers uh, logo, which I love. It's me, you, and Gubbins. Yeah, uh, he's the leprechaun. <laughs> it's a little early, but okay, maybe next week. But I guess it's past next no, week. No, it'll right. be over. It'll be over. I like next it. Week. I like we're it. Looking I like forward it. I take to it. it back. And we're looking forward to our St. Patrick's Day show at the Improv this Thursday. If you have not got your tickets, I'm telling you now, it sells out every year. Don't get shut out. Go to FitzDog.com, get your tickets. We're going to have some big-name celebrity guests stopping in. Me, uh, you, Gibbons, Dennis Gubbins will be performing. And uh, there'll be Irish soda bread for the crowd, Irish oh, music. Wow. Oh, yep. all right, I'll go. <laughs> you're, you're already going. Oh, <laughs> Uh, I got to figure out what the, I don't know what I'm doing. We're going to figure it out, man. It's going to be a work in progress. What do I have? 10 minutes? A tight eight? Uh, I think eight is probably better than 10. You uh, always say eight and then you do 12. Well, when I'm killing, it's hard to get off. And it's I the know. easiest art form ever. What? All right. <laughs> um, uh, not the case this year, I don't think. This week's song, Tony Kakachi. He did a song. He's out of work. He ha he used to write his songs all the time, and then he got a fucking job, and now luckily he's unemployed. And so uh, he wrote us a very cool song. Sounded kind of like the Beach Boys, wouldn't you say? No. What 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 was my first reaction? I said it. Uh, you symphonic. Uh, well, I said very I think ethereal. You said? Very yeah, ethereal. I guess Beach Boys yeah. like yeah. It yeah. was very ethereal like yeah. Yeah. Um, we enjoyed that. We got a bunch of corrections from last week. I doubt uh, it. Kim said, the, this latest episode, you all missed some low-hanging fruit to throw at Marjorie Taylor Greene. As of 2022, Georgia is a blue state. So uh -huh. if the U.S. were to divorce, as she wanted them to do, along red and blue states, uh, her, she would, she would, her state would go blue. And then I'm against the Civil War. You're coming she can out. Move. She can move to Mississippi or Al right next door to Alabama. Yeah, well. That's an easy uh, move. That makes sense for her. Yeah. Didn't she, she chair a committee this week? She's on two committees. And she is No, no, but like she she like ran the house or something one day. Like Mc McCarthy like assigned her to be like pro temp speaker or whatever. Anyway. It was disgraceful seeing her up there with a gavel and like running the show. It's crazy that she has got the traction that she's got. She has no experience. She's a she's a she's QAnon. She's fucking crazy. And and she has found her. You just see how politics works. Just be the loudest, most obnoxious person and you get power. 
I mean, the right has to be embarrassed by it, like any self-respecting person on the right. Just the list of things she's said and really believed in. And ke- listen, keep in mind, I hate Pelosi. So I, I can admit when I hate the sight of a, a certain person with the gavel. And, yeah. and so I don't know. Like, I think it's still just a statement against the left, like no, no matter what it is, you know, I guess. I don't know. Uh, this is for uh, Holly in a- Atascadero says, I don't like correcting people, so I will frame this as information for you. California has created, engineered 324 lakes to provide water for agriculture uh, throughout the state. Los Angeles has the luxury of having water provided from the Cal- Colorado River, but everywhere else uses lakes. I would highly recommend you and Aaron drive the 154 and view the, the 154 and view the enormous Kachuma Lake, which provides water to Santa Barbara County. All right. I don't know about all that. Uh, she's absolutely right. You know, they've engineered these lakes, but is she saying like San Diego and even doesn't San Francisco? I think California, believe it or not, somehow gets, well, I guess Canada goes into the Colorado River. I, I don't know. I just think it's more than Los Angeles that, that, is she saying the rest of the states on, I guess, lakes for agriculture? Yeah, she's saying know. that. It's a little um, unclear. A little unclear, Holly. She's saying that here in St. Louis Obispo, we have Nacimento and San Antonio lakes. All right, so we get it. There's lakes in California. Well, man, the lakes, I don't I don't know how long they, whatever. They're f- f- it's raining still today. Like They are full, uh, I think. Yeah, she said full? the lakes are full. She said they're all full. Oh, uh, yeah. Hopefully. All right, this one comes from Mark G. Greg, Greg, Greg. I don't like the start of that. I'm extremely huh, hungover, I and I shouldn't I shouldn't listen to you because I know you're going to fuck up, and I'm going to have to do the work of emailing you a correction. Hmm. When talking about what might have influenced the movie Groundhog oh, Day, yeah. you said Christmas Story, Ghost of Christmas Past, etc. That was not... That was a Christmas Carol, the Dickens one. Christmas Story is the goofy comedy everyone watches on Christmas with the leg lamp and the blonde kid that wants a rifle. Do I get tired of watching that every year? Absolutely not. That Christmas Carol, that Christmas story is so fucking funny. Every word is perfect. I haven't seen it since I was a child. Oh, my God. It's a little slow. I tried a couple of years ago. It's a little slow. No, it's la- I, I sit and I laugh out loud throughout it every Christmas. I love it. Wow. But so I also you think you were thinking, I mean, maybe uh, who wrote this? Mark? Can, yeah. can n- note how, Mark you know, G. I I, to- I tolerate the Fitz facts, you know, on the fly and uh, Fitz facts on the fly. And uh, I thought what you meant was it's a wonderful life. Oh, no, no. Where I meant a- it is. It's 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 a it's a time shift. It's not exactly Groundhog Day, but he does see what would happen if he, you know, if he killed himself. And so it's playing with time that way. And then he writes. And he gets to go. He gets to go. You know, into this setting that usually has him, and uh, and see it and experience it and all that stuff. Anyway. And then he goes on to say, "As I type this and listen, you called The Last of Us a movie a couple times. It's a series." Okay. He goes, "Fuck it. I'm gonna have a shot. This was taxing." All right, you see a hair of the dog. I like it. Speaking of laughing out loud, I will be at the uh, Grand Grandel Theater in St. Louis on April 1st, which our f- our fine friends that produce our show. Speaking uh, of taxing. Speaking of taxing. <laughs> Chris Denman and the crew are producing me in St. Louis at the Grandel April 1st. Uh, Louisville at uh, Laugh Louisville April 6th through 8th. This is a new date just announced. Mohegan Sun in Connecticut, April 13 through 15. Then coming to Oxnard, Levity Live, Escondido, Columbia, Missouri, Kansas City, Boston. All tickets at FitzDog.com. Mike, let's talk about Green Chef. I love Green Chef. Are you kidding uh, me? Uh, here are the it, menus. You ready? Two menus right here. Yeah. I cooked uh, chicken with garlic, uh, shard rice. Look at that bowl. And that's and with, how it came out. Then they have the directions, oh, step by step. So easy, then, with pictures. 
Sophie cooked the maple cauliflower power bowl Ooh. when she was back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a because uh, she's gluten free. Because they offer gluten free. Exactly. Yep. They offer keto, paleo, vegan, whatever you want. They got it all. They've got 30 plus recipes weekly. You can mix mix and match from different dietary preferences in the same box without changing your plan. You can get that protein packed. Uh, the newest collection of recipes fit for a high protein dietary preference. This is the one I sent to my mom and, uh, she loved it because I'm trying to put weight on my mom. Yep. She's 80 and she's, uh, she's getting too skinny. Convenient so you can and easy. Are you kidding me? You bring more flavors to the table. They got elevated recipes, seasonal organic produce. It's eat no brainer. One stop shop, quick breakfast, brunch kits, wholesome lunches. You can do it all. Uh, so these 10 minute lunches especially are fun. Uh, it is a uh, green chef is the number one meal kit for eating well with dinners that work for you, not the other way around. You understand what we're trying to tell you? Mm-hmm. Um, they, they, uh, make time for, uh, 700 under recipe. Tr- try the fast and fit recipes, 750 calories or less. And you can and make it all only- in. It's the only meal kit, by the way. It's both carbon and plastic offset. 100% of the carbon footprint, as well as 100% of the plastic in every box. Offset. All right. Well, listen. Go to greenchef.com slash papers60, the number 60, and use code papers60 to get 60% off plus free shipping. Uh, Again, that's go to greenchef.com slash papers 60 and use code papers 60 to get 60 percent off plus free shipping it's hot it, it's it's just look it's the number one meal kit for eating well green chef get involved okay you got some paper to crinkle let's get to the front page oh listen to this listen to this it's a uh, amazon oh what audio let's go all right What happened? I know you're thrown because it's actually a story you put in the script. So you're supposed to read Oh, I didn't hear it. you like yell like, uh, oh, okay, here we are, front page. Goats run loose in San Francisco. No one knows where they came from. That was the headline. Mm. A spokesman for San Francisco's Animal Care and Control told San Francisco SF Gate that a call was received about a gray goat running in traffic. The caller reported that they didn't know where the goat went after civilians chased it away. Then a video posted to Reddit on Wednesday afternoon shows at least four goats running through the South Beach neighborhood near Rincon Hill Dog Park as several onlookers try, unsuccessfully, to corral them. At the end of the video, the goats run off into the distance. So this goat grazing company... I didn't know those existed, said the goats seen Wednesday don't seem to belong to any grazing service. They checked the area they were seen in for signs of a grazing installation and didn't find any fencing signs or other items that would uh, well, indicate Well, you know what they a- do? These companies, they bring goats to your farm and they get rid of your weeds for you. They like, they're, they're like lawnmowers. I love goats, by the way. Yeah. Uh, Instagram, wait, do you see when goats pass out? No. What? Oh, dude, there's a video. I, I'm, we should put it on the website. There's a video that I think a delivery truck is driving like onto this like grassy driveway, like to a farm. And there's like, say, six goats. It hits like a pothole and goes bang. And the goats just freeze and fall over <laughs> like they were tased. It's no, no. There's so many videos of goats. There's probably a, a biological term for it. They literally lock up and tip over. Wow. And then they wake up like, you know, 10 seconds later or whatever it is. It's, I guess it's when they're startled. I, I, it seems like the worst defense mechanism. Like, it's just basically screaming, you can eat me now. I won't even run or struggle. Which just, does not make them a very good animal, which makes it very ironic that they are considered the goat. They are the goat. Um, Anyway, the guy goes, at this point, the only thing I know is they weren't ours, but it's really odd because there just aren't that many goat grazing companies that will work in San Francisco. There's a possibility the goats might have been meat animals as they weren't wearing collars and appeared to be a breed of goats typically used for meat 
It could be that someone was transporting meat goats and maybe they fell off the truck. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. How do I buy the rights to this? I want to write Planet of the Goats, where goats rise up and take over. That's what yeah, I want to do. You can't stop them because you can't starve them. Most most wars are won with attrition. You 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 seize, you do a, a siege of a city and you yeah. starve them. But the goats will eat fucking anything. <laughs> oh wait, Chris put it in the name fainting. It refer it refers to a breed characteristic known as myotonia congen, congenita, a condition in which the muscle cells experience prolonged contraction when the goat is startled. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that must make it the absolute easiest farm animal to have sex with. Yes, and it, it probably you just feels run up great. and go boo, boo. It, yeah. Planet of the Goats. We've got some bad ideas. That's the tag. That's the tagline. Just I'm, I'm, I might start writing it during this podcast. Oh, yeah. My only other guess was Elon Musk fired all these goats from the Twitter goat yoga room. <laughs> that's my only other guess in San Francisco. How is San Francisco yeah. all those, all those? I don't know what you call. Well, I guess the millennials. I want to call them like yuppies. How are they not chasing these things around for uh, goat cheese? And how are the gay guys not chasing? I mean, goats are, uh, it's like, yeah, I know gay, gay guys like bears. They, they probably like goats also. <laughs> um, I just got an email back from Aisha Tyler. We asked her to do the um, St. Patrick's Day show, and she said she will be out of the country. Poop. Thanks for thinking of me. Now she's booking her flight. Yeah. All right. Here's your story, Pally. An after-school Satanist club in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I, I love it. it's after-school. Most kids are Satanists during class. Uh, or maybe they don't even go to school. I don't know how they're keeping that dream alive. Is, it, is Satan telling them, you know what, kids, stay in school? Stay in school, kids. You can do, you can do my work better in third yeah. period than you can hanging around in an alley. Respect um, your elders. So they are threatening to raise hell after local district leaders denied them the ability to convene on their school grounds. The ACLU, together with its Pennsylvania chapter, sent a letter to the Saucon Valley School District demanding they allow the After School Satan Club, or <laughs> ASSC, access to school facilities in accordance with the U.S. Constitution's First Amendment right to practice religion freely. Um they say wow. that they were initially approved and then they were uh, taken away their right to, to meet. So they're saying it's a secular organization and it's, its members do not actually believe in worshiping the devil, but hmm. they do. But but the club does not believe in introducing religion into public schools and will only open a club if other religious groups are operating on campus. By oh. contrast, the Good News Club, an organization sponsored by a local evangelical church devoted to spreading the word about the Bible, is allowed to host meetings on public school property. So, of course, the Christians are taking the bait. The whole Bible is about driving out Satan. you got to yeah. fight Satan. But Jesus never dealt with a dozen acne-ridden heavy metal heads with nothing <laughs> but time on their hands. I want to join this club. These guys, as David Tell would call them, the unfuckables. <laughs> Do you remember he had that joke? <laughs> no, what is that one? <laughs> he used to have this joke about, he goes, ah, oh, yeah, high school. I used to hang around with the, the head of the Den Dungeons and Dragons Club, and he listed these other kids, and he calls, we called ourselves the unfuckables. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine this club's update. Imagine if they were real believers, their update to Satan, uh... Uh, Satan's like, uh, okay, next order of business, Pennsylvania. How's it going in the Keystone State? Uh, well, my dark lord, uh, not great. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, did you did you sue them like we talked about? Uh, yes, you're king of demons. Uh, and uh, all right, well, did you contact the ACLU? Like I said, Satan's a very rational guy at this point. Uh, Leslie does very good work with them. I told you to give her a call. I think she can help. Uh, yes, you're unholy one, but they uh, rescinded our permit because of pushback from the community. <laughs> Gee, damn it. The community. Wow. I guess there's nothing we could do. So you're saying Satan's gotten soft. Satan is very reasonable. Yeah. Yeah. He, listen, he's scared of red tape just like anybody. Right, the public right. school system. Yeah. Come on. You can't fight City Hall. 
Yeah, I mean, the fire and brimstone thing, that's so 11th century. Nowadays, yeah. it's about redistricting. It's about uh, community access. Yeah, yet they were still very respectful and scared of him. But yeah, he he has gotten softer. Yeah. All right, time to move on to Cocaine Cat. Cocaine Cat. A large cat called a serval rescued from a tree in Cincinnati tested positive for cocaine, an animal rescue group said this week. Animal control officials said the big cat escaped when his owner was pulled over by police on January 28th. The big cat, cat leapt from the car into a tree. Hamilton County dog wardens responded to reports of a, quote, leopard in a tree around 2 a.m. Cincinnati Animal Care's Ray Anderson said they retrieved Amory, I guess that's the cat's name, and brought him to the organization's facility. The organization's medical team looked over the big cat, who'd suffered a broken leg during the retrieval. They also, they also performed a DNA test, which determined the cat was a serval, not a leopard, and that he had cocaine in his system. No! <laughs> yep, it's not the first time that Cincinnati Animal Care has had a wild animal test positive for drugs. In 2022, the group took in a capuchin monkey named Neo that had meth in his system. How the, the fuck cat will now call the Cincinnati him? Zoo home? What? How the fuck do you catch a <laughs> monkey on meth? That that guy deserves a reward. Oh, yeah. so they, so, oh, so, so the cat will now be at the Cincinnati uh, Zoo. Well, that's good news. He'll be able to score some more blow. <laughs> I think you catch the monkey on meth by offering it some meth if it blows you. I think that's what a lot of meth heads, <laughs> that's how you get them. Yeah. They, that's think, routine. They're not threatened by that. That's the usual process. I like this whole concept because I think a lot of us get distracted in life. We start thinking about... You know, the country's gotten too polarized or would Megan have made a good queen? <laughs> and uh, but then if you think about it, th these are city problems and, we, and we're not in the moment. You see. So what we need is to release animals. When you see a leopard with powder around his nose, <laughs> you get pulled right back into the moment. You're you are consciously engaging in the present tense. And that's what we need. Grizzly bears on uh, on on. Uh, on on uh, methamphetamine, yeah, you know, just just every city should have wild animals running loose. I think it's also a good idea if, like, in case you're pulled over by the cops, you just lower the window and have that big cat jump out into a tree. <laughs> I think. Have you been yeah. drinking, sir? Drinking with that big cat in the car <laughs> who's on cocaine? Are you crazy? <laughs> Thank God he got out of the car. He would not shut up. I'm sure it was the big cat's idea once he did cocaine. They're yeah. driving. They, come on, we're driving to Vegas. Let's go, <laughs> pussy. Oh, shit, the cops. All right, all right, just pull over slowly. Act calm. Fuck this. I'm out of here. <laughs> Jesus, look at that cat picture that Chris put in here. Holy shit. I know. Shit. That is, thing is beautiful. No fucking way am I sleeping in the same house as that. I can Some cats I don't even like sleeping in the same house with. Yeah. They're just going to bite your neck. Disneyland has finally removed a song with racist origins from their parade. Splash Mountain, a popular ride at the amusement park, features images and themes from the company's racist 1946 film Song of the South. The Magic Happens Parade has been adjusted to remove the song Zippity Doo Dah. The tune has been replaced with the song from Peter Pan instead. First of all, I did a deep dive on Peter Pan. Do you know the origins of Peter Pan? Uh, well, I know that Barry wrote it, and I used to know a lot about it, and the, the, the family was next door and everything. Well, according to this article, Peter Pan was a deranged psychopath oh. who tricked and trapped little kids in Neverland. He killed them after they grew up, which is why they never could leave as adults. Captain Hook escaped Neverland as an adult, which explains why Peter killed Hook and fed his arm to a crocodile. Wow. In the original draft of the novel, Peter is a villain kidnapping young children from their beds. Basically, the or original story, the hero is a total sociopath. He's literally a serial killer, not just of pirates. Yeah. Did so you that's see what they finding, replaced it with. Did you see Finding Leaving? Oh, finding yeah. Finding Neverland, I think it is. Yeah, right. Le leaving is a whole different... Well, it's a very similar story, actually, but... Uh, 
Finding Neverland with Johnny Depp and that young kid yeah. who's probably 20 now. But I remember once someone was over and it was like, great scenes. Like, let's just watch great scenes. And I'm like, oh, my God, that scene with Johnny Depp and the little kid on the park bench. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but it's a sad scene. Anyway, I played that. And I, I was like, this kid should have won the Oscar just for this scene. Anyway, play the scene. And, and it's over. And I, and I like look over and I'm like, uh, what'd you think? The person, the whole face was covered in tears and they just went, why didn't he win the Oscar? <laughs> <laughs> the boy was yeah. incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Song of the South is based on a series of short stories featuring a character named Uncle Remus, a black man in the Reconstruction era who is essentially glorifying slavery. So, uh, I yeah. think, it, I, well, they, I think they should keep it, but just rename the character to, of Uncle Remus to, uh, Justice Clarence Thomas. Oh, that would fix it all. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know the story. I can't really speak very well, but I do know when I looked it up for a second, there's a defense on YouTube and it was interesting because the person compared, uh, the Uncle Remus character to every, basically any other black character at that time who was usually just bombastic, buffoonish comic relief uh, or, or evil, I guess. And, uh, and that this character, while flawed, and there's a lot, obviously, that's true about all of this, but I guess they were saying there's more than one side to this. And maybe with a warning, anyway, they went on and on. But, you know, when I went down this wormhole a little, uh, Old Man River, which is completely different type of uh, story because it's very much on the side of how insane and, and, and brutal being the life of a slave is, un unlike the other one. Old Man River used to have the N-word in it. Really? I did not know that. Is that only when Chris Denman sang it or was it always like that? Well, he, he tends to put those in a lot of songs, yeah. except hip hop, where they're already, he's bored with those. Yeah. But uh, I, uh, anyway, this is, that song is, it won the Oscar, Zippity Doo Dah. Yeah. The song has nothing to do, it's just a joyous song, right? Yeah. Sadly, it's in the mouth of a, <laughs> a joyous slave. But, uh, I don't know. It's an interesting issue. I mean, it won the Oscar, and I think it deserved it, and it's 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 an amazing song. Uh, so the song gets killed too, huh? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I don't know. It's uh, Disney is definitely uh, in the in the crosshairs right now. I mean, it's like the left is attacking it for not being PC enough. The right is attacking it for being too PC. Uh, they just can't win. Yeah, and art, there's an exception with art, you know, and I can't articulate that because uh, I'm, an I'm bored already with it. But I don't know. It's an it's it's an, it's not an open and shut case, I don't think. It's not All black right. and white. Let's, Let's just cut, say that. Let's cut down a good news for Gubbins. Oh, hold on. There you go. So Gubbins, as people have been updated, had knee surgery, and so he's sitting on his couch getting fatter by the day. He's plumping up like Thanksgiving is coming and he's a turkey. Uh, but he invites everybody over, and he sends constant emails guilting you for not— What was the one he sent you the other day? A visit would be nice. <laughs> I'm like, are you a 90-year-old Jewish woman all of a sudden? A visit so, would be nice. And so you go over and you realize he doesn't need you to come over. He, there's are, there's always seven other people already there. Yeah. And then and then once you get there, it's like he, he's trying to drive you out of his house. He's so obnoxious. He, you, you play this dice game with him and he's constantly correcting you. We talked about that last week. And and it's like he, he draws you in and then drives you away. It's a story of life. Now, are you going to mention he actually hasn't gained weight? He says he lost five pounds, but I think he's not weighing the leg. Immediately, I said that was all knee bone. And then uh, Rabi said it's uh, muscle mass. <laughs> so 
<laughs> we all we all pounced on that. Uh, but he's doing well. So I was there uh, last night, uh, and we, we went over and we just started watching like YouTube, just trying to find the funniest things and make each other laugh. But we wound up uh, watching Anchorman Two. Now, I think I saw it along the way, and I've definitely seen bloopers online, but. When was the last time you saw Anchorman 2? I watched it not that long ago. It's so impressive. I couldn't believe. I was imagining the script, and I'm like, this has to be four jokes a page. Yeah. It n- Not one thing was boring and, like, set up or, like, you know. It, it was just incredible. And crazy ideas. Crazy. I totally disagree. I watched it and I what? found it to be I I found it to be trying too hard and uh not relevant. I I, I didn't love it. All right. Didn't love Someone it. listening, watch the watch Anchorman 2 and and report back. S- write write us a, le- a letter to the podcast. We'll read it next week. I now listen. I did get a little stoned over there. So now I'm starting to doubt myself, but I couldn't like someone, we were laughing so hard and some, this was the perfect word. I think Dennis said it. He goes, it's relentless with the jokes. Like it was unbelievable. And Holy shit. Um, what's his name? Uh, uh, who, who's, who plays the weatherman? Uh, Steve Carell. Yeah, Carell. I mean, listen, it's they go to it a lot, but I I didn't get tired of it. Is so fucking great at being stupid. It's Six amazing. point three out of ten on IMDb. I I I think it's one of those we got to revisit. All right, I'll watch it again. I'll I'll take a look. Sometimes when you're in a shitty mood, a good comedy it doesn't ring as funny as it should. Also, I saw this totally independent of any pressure, like with the like awareness of Anchorman One, you know, which was amazing. Yeah. But Anchorman, I'm wondering if we're gonna find people that like Anchorman Two. Like for instance, I saw Deadpool Two without having seen Deadpool One, and I couldn't believe how funny it was. Oh yeah, yeah. Those are those are both amazing. Was there a three, or was there just one and two? I think there has been a three, maybe. Yeah. I don't know if. Um... Uh, what's I'm going to look it, it up this week. He said 75% on Rotten Tomatoes with the critics, 52 audience. I think there was too much of a hang up with Anchorman 1. I think it deserves a revisit, I'm telling you. All right, well, speaking of entertainment, let's get to entertainment. All right. Here we go. I'm going to shake up something different. Here's lube. <laughs> it's not a paper. It's superior lubricant for bicycles. Okay. And the ball work? and the aerosol can. All right. You're fucking your bicycle? Yeah. You know, it's the, you know, you put a rubber on. Mine happens to be a f- diameter of a wheel. That's all. Yeah. Uh, um, entertainment. All right. So people, a lot of people wrote in. They wanted to hear us talk about the Chris Rock special. Uh, you only saw the first half, correct? I'll talk about Anchorman 2 again, but I cannot right. speak to the Chris Rock special. Well, here's what I'll say about it. It was very strong. It was, I mean, the, the thing that overwhelms me is as somebody who just shot a, a one-hour stand-up special with probably 2% of the budget that Chris Rock spent, I was overwhelmed by the production value. All the pre-show stuff, the staging, the backstage, the lighting, the amount of cameras, even his outfit. Like, everything was just so fucking first rate it was almost intimidating it was like all right just do the fucking comedy yeah and um, my good friend joel joel gallon directed it yeah i mean it was just super glossy and smooth and and good but uh you know i think you know the criticism some people have of chris rock is that he does that preacher thing where he keeps teeing up the premise over and over again like a chorus i don't mind that because it's it's his rhythm it's he's got it, there's something very awkward about Chris Rock that I find yeah. endearing. There's something right. very genuine about how awkward he is. He's not Chappelle. He's not a natural, smooth, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, comedian. He's just he's sort of just like a guy who's finding his way, uh, like me in that last sentence. And um, 
<laughs> so, but but I think there was a lot of strong stuff. I thought it's I, the, the stuff about Will Smith was ballsy as shit. Yep. Oh, orator, maybe that's what I was trying to say. Uh, so, <laughs> um, but I, but I thought it was really strong. Yeah, he has a consistent rhythm, and that rhythm is awkward. That rhythm is, you know, uh, not sometimes or most of the time not smooth. You know, like. But then, you know, a lot of the times it's like that, it's like that little footwork when you're going up to kick the ball and then, but he lands that punchline, you know, exactly. so they, that's he a has that rhythm and he knows where he's landing it. You know right. what I mean? And right. that's flawless when he lands it. Um, uh, we but, had but our, cur- yeah, cursing more, saying the N word more, um, yeah. than usual. So, uh, and I've that's noticed new. his audience is getting blacker. Or they're choosing to shoot more black members of the audience. He used to be a he used to be a real crossover comic, and most of his audience was white. And uh, now it's uh, um, more diverse than it was. Yeah, absolutely. Um, our friend, our great friend Pete Scott, who we've talked about in the past, sent us an idea to talk about on the Sunday papers this week that we're going to get to right now, uh, yeah. which is um, basically the Washington Post pointed out how often the Oscars get it wrong. And they pointed out over the last 47 years who won the Oscar and who should have won the Oscar. So we thought this might be an interesting thing since the Oscars are tonight. And uh, and we'll see this. First of all, it's overwhelming that they have 10 nominees for his best, best picture. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It should be five. No, everyone gets a gold star. Right. But listen, we were talking before the podcast when Pete sent this to us, you know, like, all right, here's the first category. It's 1976. Here's the first year. So this what I'm wondering is how bad Hollywood has gotten. And, and there's there, there are good films out there. Don't get me wrong. But like these are like what I'll call like forever movies, you know, like a God Godfather, Apocalypse Now. Those are forever movies. You know what I mean? Where are those? I. <laughs> I joked that you know you loved Coda. No one remembers Coda, and no. it was it was it, Coda yeah. last year or two right. years ago. I don't Nobody even know. Nobody will remember, right? And um, anyway, seventy six. The nominees were All the President's Men, Bound for Glory, Network, which never leaves my top five movies of all time, Rocky, and Taxi Driver. Rocky won Best Picture, and they're saying the actual Best Picture, Time Has Told, is Network, which I lo- already, already I like this article. I thought they were going to say All the President's Men or yeah, Taxi 76. Driver. I mean, it was amazing, though, Rocky. you got to remember, 1976 was the bicentennial of the United States, and here's this movie about an American story written and directed by an American. Uh, there was something very... Uh, patriotic about it winning that year. Yeah. But, and then we can gloss through some of these. 77, it was Annie Hall. They thought that's what should have won. Star Wars was that year also. Uh, 78 is Deer Hunter should have won. An unmarried woman won. Wow. Uh, Midnight Express. Midnight Express was, that was a movie that really was powerful and stayed with people for decades. Oh, yeah, and Heaven Can Wait and Coming Home were that year. 79. Okay, dude, all that jazz. I don't know the last time you saw all that jazz. It's a, it's unbelievable. Bob Fosse. All, all that jazz. Apocalypse Now, Breaking Away, Kramer versus Kramer, Norma Ray. Kramer versus Kramer won. It's an amazing movie, but they're thinking now Apocalypse Now. Yeah, I mean, nothing touches Apocalypse Now because it wasn't just... Uh, a movie about Vietnam. It was also a movie about colonialism. It was about Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. It went. It was. It was. It was a very important movie. 1980, Ordinary People. I remember that. Unbelievable. But that year, Coal Miner's Daughter, Elephant Man, Raging Bull, Tess. And keep in mind, they they think now. Uh, I don't even know the actual best picture. They said split decision. What? What? Chris, can you look up? No, what the one winner in- was Ordinary People, but they're saying it should have been. One person says that it should have been uh, Ordinary People, but get this—that was the year of The Shining. 
Oh, no shit. Yeah. That's Whoa. what I'm saying. These years, the 70s, by the way, we didn't even go back. The early 70s are the most crazy. Like, it's yeah. unbelievable with, you know, 70, I think, 2 and 4 were Godfather and Godfather 2. I might have that yeah. right. Maybe 71, 70. Anyway, it goes on. Uh, it's But just seeing all these. 1982, E.T., Gandhi, Missing, Tootsie, The Verdict. Gandhi won. They think the actual one should be Tootsie. I think E.T. E.T.'s forever. Yeah. Tootsie's yeah. great. Don't get me wrong. Right. Um, um Amadeus, could, the killing. It's, un, it's these the, these lists are incredible. And then you had eighty six, Children of a Lesser God, Hannah and Her Sisters, Platoon, A Room with a View, and Platoon won. And they're saying Hannah and Her Sisters should have won. Right, Hannah and Her Sisters is amazing. Well, you have a love affair with Woody Allen. That's. But then you cut to let's cut to two thousand and eighteen, okay. and you've got. Uh, Black Klansman, The Black Panther, The Green Room. Do you see it? <laughs> what? Is that Bohemian, real? Yeah, Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, A Star is Born, Vice, and I guess The Green Book won. The Green Book was a good movie. It won't stand the test of time. Green Book was an after-school special. At 2020, Nomad Land. Come on. It, it was a movie about a woman living in a van. Uh, here's a redo year for sure. 1990, Awakenings, Dances with Wolves, Ghost, The Godfather Part 3. How did that get nominated? And Goodfellas. And Goodfellas did not win. Wow. Goodfellas is the top top three movies ever made in this country. Yeah. Um, so 2022, let's make a prediction. Here are the nominees. All okay. Quiet on the Western Front. Didn't see it. I heard that's the best movie of the year. Really? Yeah, I, I have heard that. Avatar. Some people no. like that. Banshees of Inishirin. People are very mixed on that. I loved it. I thought I it liked was a it. beautiful movie. Great yeah. acting. I mean, no it was doubt, a little... No doubt it's a beautiful movie. There's no doubt about that. But yeah. It was a little bit uh, satirical. I mean, the cutting off of the fingers. It was it was some weird stuff, but I, I, I thought it worked. Um, everything, Everywhere, All at Once was a really beautiful interesting you know creative effort i it annoyed me all right go ahead did you see the fablemans yes that annoyed me more than everything everywhere movie? all at once the yeah. fablemans is nothing nowhere never <laughs> the only scene i liked in the fablemans was the last scene of the movie because it had uh what's his name you know blue velvet uh david lynch yeah, Dave, have you seen the movie? No. It has nothing to do with the movie, but there's a scene with David Lynch, and uh, he's playing John Ford, I think. And and anyway, I fucking just love David Lynch, and he's a great actor. Uh, there's also Top Gun Maverick, which I think is the favorite to win. Yeah, um, someone, did you see the story this week? They want to rescind its nomination because it got funding from a Russian oligarch or something? No, really? Who knows? I don't read, I only read headlines. <laughs> well, no, no, I don't but know. I mean, th movies, th that was a headline. Action movies tend not to win. Like, I don't think Bond has ever won. And I mean, there's a, there's a, a there's an argument that like Skyfall maybe should have won the year it was nominated. Um, action movies have a hard time. So I'm going to predict everything, everywhere, all at once. But I would like to see Banshees of Minas and win. And, uh, you know, uh, All Quiet on the Western Front is foreign language, right? Is it? Uh, oh, is it? It's on French. Well, Chris, uh, what is, I guess I could Google it. What is, uh, yeah, I think so. I think it's also nominated, I think, for Best Foreign Film. So what's your pick? Who do you think is going to win? Um, you know, listen, if we were betting money, I guess I would say everything everywhere, but, uh, I'm going to root for oh, Banshees might win it, but I'm going to go for all quiet. Wow. It, I think it won the BAFTA. Everything everywhere has won every other award. And yeah. they did a little article about that happened one time before and it didn't win the Oscar. 
And I think it tracked that the exception with that film also was it didn't win the BAFTA. By the way, I might be wrong. It maybe it won the mm. BAFTA. I kind of don't know what I'm talking about. But All um, right, well, that's par for the course. What What do you mean? I, that's I what got people come with... for. People come to see. They don't come to hear the news. They come to see how wrong we are about everything. I'm very sure about Philadelphia people being animals. <laughs> I had that down. There's no gray area there. Um, it's right, German, to... English, and French are the languages. Oh, Just wow. tell me, though, what who, what is the dominant language? I did say German and French. Dude, 90% on Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. I'll see it. In did German? you get all the screeners sent to you this year? I got that. Well, it's Netflix, by the way. I Oh, okay. Good. I, w- I was forced to read that in high school, and that is one of the few books... That I still remember vividly. Oh, my God. Yeah. Who wrote it? I have no idea. Don't do that to me. All right. I'm illiterate. Um, all right. Let's make let's make America Florida. I think Flaubert. Okay. Let's do it. Uh, yeah, can, we, can we crinkle? <laughs> there That's we so go. stupid. By the way, a lot of people are pointing out that uh, DeSantis has been uh, associated with this Make America Florida headline. I don't know if he's using it or is other he selling are, merch. I don't know. But but just for the record, we did not make up Make America Florida. That was sent in and we right. decided to co-opt it as a segment on the show. I oh, my God. I hope he affiliates himself with that slogan. Yeah. because if that is not a career ender. I yeah. don't know what is. Right, right. Here's a typical uh, a traffic, uh, like a car being pulled over in Florida. Here we go. They were pulled over for tinted windows in Florida. Then came the body cavity search. According to a police report, uh, at around 1 a.m., deputies noticed the silver Toyota Camry traveling east with windows that had a, quote, very dark tint. As the deputies hit their emergency lights and attempted to pull over the Camry, they noticed the driver moving around in his seat and leaning over the console. Already, this is suspicious. I thought that I thought there was dark tint. Anyway, after the car came to a stop, a deputy approached the 25-year-old passenger. The officer wrote in the report that he noticed a strong odor of burnt cannabis emanating from inside the vehicle. Mm. The 34-year-old driver was asked to get out of the car for a search of the interior. Deputies spotted a small plastic cup in the center console's cup holder containing a white crystal substance. By the way, I think every car in Florida has that. Um, <laughs> I think it's, imme- like a pine, it's like having the pine tree freshener hanging off your, uh, yeah. your radio. I think it's also an option on any cars bought in Florida. <laughs> like, it, okay, does this one come yeah. with white substance in a cup? Right. Um, they immediately recognized it as, of course, crystal meth. The substance was later field tested and they were correct. Both suspects were cuffed. When asked if she had anything on her, the passenger admitted to storing meth in her vagina and blamed the driver for telling her to, quote, hide her stash when they were being pulled over. The report says a female deputy was requested and assisted with removing the drugs from her body cavity from inside, according to the report, uh, found inside, according to the report, a plastic bag with 10.8 grams of meth. By the way, yeah. just just to point out, we are mocking this woman as we were as we are both on methamphetamines as we record this podcast. I'm on them right now. I am on them right now. Took a little riddle in this morning. Yep. Uh, but I keep mine in my ass, so it's a little different. I'm not Florida. <laughs> yes, keep it in a cool, dark place. That's what the doctors say. By the way, yeah. have you ever seen the lips on a meth head? This <laughs> woman is going to need some Vagisil stat. I hope it was a good bag. I mean, if that yeah, that can get in your blood system down there for sure. This is so common in Florida that I'm sure the police have a code for it. You know, methamphetamines stored in a vagina. They're like, we got a 327 on I-80 East. <laughs> <laughs> or like, or a panther, a panther with cocaine in its system. We got a yeah. 527. 
Okay. On it's like, all right, Santa imagine the dispatcher. All right, we got a cocaine cat up a tree. I mean, what a <laughs> night in Florida traffic. And we got, uh, yeah, it's crazy. And that was Ohio, though, right? But I did yeah. read a story. There was some story this week of another, like, because Cocaine Bear is bringing out all these stories anyway. I think there was one in Florida. All right, are we doing sports? Let's do some sports. Let's do it. I'm going to go back to the Amazon Prime bag. Okay. Sports. An artificial turf uh, is potentially linked to cancer deaths of six Phillies ball players. Mm. A report on a possible link between a rare brain cancer that killed six professional U.S. baseball players and toxic chemicals and artificial turf is raving, raising a new round of questions over whether synthetic sports fields pose a health threat to athletes and others who use them. The six athletes who all died from glioblastoma played most of their careers with the Philadelphia Phillies. Maybe that killed them. Um, a team that for decades competed on artific artificial turf in Veterans Stadium. Yeah, are we not going to explore the possibility that they also lived in Philadelphia for a long time? I, did, I looked it up online. Philadelphia was named the most toxic city in America. Uh, are you the talking about their personalities? <laughs> The EPA data compared the air quality, water quality, population health, and toxic release inventory of the 80 largest metropolitan areas in the U.S. Philadelphia failed. They were the number one uh, in, in the pounds of potentially dangerous chemicals released into the environment from industries such as manufacturing, utilities, metal, and coal mining. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the AstroTurf was probably the safest part of the city. Listen, God bless the families of these, uh, is it seven that have Six. died? Six. Don't yes. blow this out of proportion. Right. I'm already getting ahead of myself. I'm sure there's more sadly coming. But I, I have, listen, I am in no way making a joke about them and all this. The only thing is, how come more fans didn't get it? That's what I really am asking. I mean, the front row fans in Philly, they're not close enough to the field. I wish the Plus players they generally were storm onto the field during every game. So they're get, they're making contact with that AstroTurf. Yeah. Um by the way, I've played and been on fields uh and when AstroTurf was first coming. Have you ever been on the ones that had the black pellets? Oh yeah. You you almost like you could see them when you were on the field, but you couldn't see them from like the stands. But first of all, also that field got so hot, yeah, it was insane. And I know I know there's also forget the toxic thing. There's also kids having heat stroke and and athletes having heat stroke passing out, especially when they go back early, like for double sessions at the end of summer and stuff before school starts. Like, no, that my was son, not a good idea. I, I immediately thought of my son because he played uh, from the time he was six until today. He still plays soccer. He has played on the, a club team and a school team. So he has played double practices like three or four days a week and then games on weekends. Uh, and he's still playing in college. So he's like he's been on AstroTurf his entire life. Wow. And that shit does feel toxic. When you stand on it on a hot day, oh. it, it has a smell to it. No, it does. It always smelled like um, fuel. Yep. It's like there was some, and I'm sure so, like it, it's probably an explanation, like an ethanol or some all. And that's why, to me, it smelled kind of like in the kerosene gasoline family. When he was, when he was young. Well, if it's rubber, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. Go ahead. When they put down the field at um, the Santa Monica Airport, the soccer fields at the Santa Monica yeah. Airport, there was a dumpster that had like the clippings of the of the field, you know, the the extra astroturf. And I went I went in it and I pulled a bunch out and I brought it back to my house huh. and I I did my whole backyard in astroturf <laughs> and I put in goals and I spray okay. painted lines. So your, in our son, backyard. your son had it. Owen had it at home too. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, God. All right. I just got an email from Judd Apatow. 
that uh, he will not be able to make it to the St. Patrick's Day show because he's going to Sandler's Mark Twain Award. Wow. Which is was also um, uh, Nick Swartzen's excuse. Interesting. Why don't yeah. we have it there? We'll do it in the Kennedy Center. And then he um, said you were funny on Corolla. I didn't know that Judd listened to Corolla. I guess maybe he listened because I was on. That's nice. That's very well. It's a very nice compliment, also. Um, so yeah, the Mark Twain Award for Waterboy, huh? Interesting. All right. <laughs> oh come on! You can't take away from Adam Sandler. No, I, I love Adam He's, Sandler. I mean, that guy is a prolific, positive force in the world. I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Adam Sandler's, and like oh, some yeah. of his movies are silly, but they, they, they weren't trying to be anything else. Right. Um, uh, nice. What do we got left the world, here? By the way. Oh yeah. Um, all right. So we didn't we didn't read these stories. So let's cut straight down to this day in history. Let's see. Here you go, little rare little uh, paper. Sorry. Okay. So in 1930, on this very day. Mohandas Gandhi began a 241-mile civil disobedience march. Uh, he went from he was protesting the British monopoly on salt and against British rule in India. I didn't realize they were still ruling in 1930. What year did they stop ruling in India? Jesus. Um, Britain's Salt Acts prohibited Indians from collecting or selling salt, a staple in the Indian diet. Citizens were forced to buy the vital mineral from the British, who, in addition to exercising a monopoly over the manufacture and sale of salt, also exerted a heavy salt tax. Although India's poor suffered like most under the tax, Indians required salt. Defying this tax, the Salt Acts, Gandhi reasoned, would be an ingeniously simple way for many Indians to break up British law of non-violently. He declared resistance to British salt policies to be the unifying theme of his new campaign of Satyagrasa, or mass civil disobedience. So he set out with 78 followers, and um, uh, they they marched. I mean, it's just it's just so amazing because uh, it, the the fucking what what will people do now? We I won't even walk to the store to get some salt. Like we're so fucking uncommitted. <laughs> like they they were you marched. Th- you went on one of those marches in the last couple of years. Did I? You didn't go to the women's march. Oh yeah, I did. Yeah, but I was more of a subway now, march. Now's your time to say yes. We took the subway to the march, and it was backed up so far deep that you couldn't move when you got off the subway. Women, oh, when marches are a hassle, that's the worst. Uh, well, I'm just saying, women were so into that march, which was what, like 2019? And the next year, like a third of them showed up, and the next year, a tenth of them showed up. That, mm-hmm. that thing fucking lost steam. Yeah. Um, well... Changing subjects for a second. Have you? I have not read it, of course, because I don't read. But uh, the book Salt apparently is fascinating, and how throughout the ages it was a currency. No and, shit. Yeah, yeah, and that valuable. And there's sayings like "worth his salt," and there's mm. another famous saying that still exists because of it. Anyway, um, he was a salty yeah. dog. I don't think that's the one. I don't think that's I don't think that that salty dog is uh, worth much with the salt mm. on him. No. Um, but yeah, so this I do want to read more about this, but that's amazing. Started with 78. Started with 78. Many, what did it build to? Do Along we think? the way, he addressed large tens crowds. Tens of thousands. Yeah. And tens of thousands. He would lead, lead prayers and um they plan to work the salt flats on the beach encrusted with crystallized sea salt at every high tide, but the police had forestalled him by crushing the salt deposits into the mud. Um, Gandhi reached down and picked up a small lump of natural salt out of the mud, and British law had been defied. Thousands more followed his lead, and in coastal cities, Indian nationalists led crowds of citizens in making salt. 
civil disobedience broke out all what? across India, soon involving millions of Indians. And the British authorities arrested more than 60,000 people. Gandhi Whoa. himself was arrested, but the march went on without him. Um, British-led Indian policemen uh, viciously beat the peaceful pro-demonstrators. Um, in January 31, Gandhi was released from prison. Uh, he met with Lord Irwin and agreed to call off the Satyagara in exchange for an equal negotiating role at a London conference in India's future. So um, he, he, you know, he became a force he couldn't ignore anymore. Uh, yeah, and I mean, this is, I know it sounds stupid way to say it, but this is like before social media, this is before self-taping, right. and like that, and you know, they control uh the media and so it's very hard to build it must have been so challenging to build a movement um and he d and he did and just on this walk it's incredible and then it says he uh uh Gandhi spoke and led prayers at, when he at the end of that and, and early the next morning walked down to the sea to make salt mm -hmm. which is that's how you and I that's called a piss when you and I do it. <laughs> when we make salt, yes. Yeah. We just pee in the ocean, and I think that's what... Anyway, terrible joke, but uh, Gandhi, boy, they should make a movie about this guy. I know, shouldn't they? They should make it long, because there's a lot to cover. Um, what year right. was that? I'm looking it up. What year was that? Gandhi? I would I'm gonna say, say 82. I'm going to say 79. Uh, all right, let's see. I'm going to say 81. I'm going to say Because I remember when I saw it. Here we go. You ready? Drum roll, please. 1981 was Atlantic City Chariots of Fire on Golden Pond. Raiders of the Lost Ark Reds. First of all, listen to those fucking movies. 1980, we already read. When the hell's is Gandhi 83? 82. E.T. Well, I already read it. E.T. The uh, Gandhi. Jesus. Missing Tootsie, the verdict. Wow. No, I mean, I read it before. Right, we're going backwards here. We're going backwards. We got to go forward into Ask Greg and Mike, our hottest new segment. All right. Well, anyone ask us anything. We just proved we know nothing. Uh, this is a segment that we try to um, take our years of living on this earth, challenging the truth and, and, uh, and impart it to you. Oh, just got a text from Pete Holmes who said that uh, I'm out of town, but thank you, sweet boy. May the luck of our people be upon ye. Oh. Okay, so he's out. Um, I read the first line of this letter. I'm a 37-year-old single male. I'm not, okay, I'm not listening. <laughs> this is from Zach. <laughs> I'm a 37-year-old single male without any sisters or very close female friends, and it recently dawned on me that I don't really know how periods work, hmm. menstruation, not punctuation. Hmm. I understand the basic concept that once a month your cunt bleeds. Oh. <laughs> oh. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> For a few days, but what I've never bothered to ask— it Sounds like he's got it. <laughs> anyone is exactly how the blood comes out. Does it seep out unnoticeably? Is it a slow and steady oh, drip, drip, drip? Or does it geyser out in spasmodic bursts without warning? Do women menstruating people, women, feel anything? Does it hurt? Do, or do they shame. just see the aftermath? I'd love both your thoughts and figure there was no one better to ask than a couple of giant pussies. Oh, wow. Switched, well, it, up. Switched it up from the C word. Okay, Zach. Mike, you've got... Uh, two daughters and yeah. an ex-wife and a current girlfriend. So you, you, you've dealt with more vaginas than I have. So why don't you answer this question? Uh, I think it gushes out like crazy and they feel shame. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you can't give them tampons. It just makes it go away instead of them dealing with their reality. I have not used it in a while. But I literally, I think I've shown it before, I have the Flow app on my phone, and that's a period app, and that 
it's very handy, you know, for women so they can see if their cycle is late or uh, anything like that. It's also very happy, uh, very handy for men who know when to just fucking say yes and yep. agree. Yep. Yeah. Then when to plan a boys' night out. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I have not been involved with my daughter's period in any way whatsoever. And... um and I'm no longer involved with my wife's period, uh, which uh, she is also no longer involved with. Oh, all right. I mean, does she like you sharing that? I don't know. Fifty. I bet you could still old. make her bleed. You could still make her bleed. Yeah. Uh, the fakening said, be a, "Be a man." The fakening said, "What are your th- top three must-try restaurants and specific dishes for the Venice and Santa Monica area of Los Angeles?" Huh. Well. I like, uh, you know, we went to is um, Hama Sushi down on the beach is if you're going to get sushi on the west side, it's fun. It's indoor, outdoor. It's been there for 40 years. Uh, great music, funky vibe, very artsy and uh, and a good hang right next to the ocean. Yeah. on You know, on Abbott Kinney, there's well, I love this restaurant, Piccolo. Which oh, I love Piccolo. There's two, there's two Piccolos. Yeah, yeah, but one on Abbott Kinney, and then, yeah, there's one on Lincoln in Santa Monica. But Piccolo is fresh homemade pasta, and it's a great Italian place. It doesn't Pretty have a affordable. Full, doesn't have a full bar, but wine and beer. And then across the street from that is Jelena, which is generally considered one of L.A.'s top restaurants. It is, then, but I think it's overhyped. I think that the I think it's really expensive. It's hard to get in, and it's one of those. Uh, what do they call it when you get small dishes instead of a full plate of food? Gypped. Yeah, that's what it's it is. Ship factor. It's the same price as a normal plate of food, but it's about a half a plate of food. Yeah, and then down the street is now a new, not a newcomer, but I mean, it's newer than Jelena, but it's. Uh, I'm forgetting the name, but it's closer to Main Street. Felix. Oh, Felix is very expensive. I eat there once. Felix is, I think, harder to get into also and everything. No, Felix is impossible to get into. I went there. I tried my my, my bill. I have a friend who started a a hedge fund, and I've talked about him before. And he's he's a guy I went to high school with who was not the brightest kid by any stretch of the imagination, but went to Wall Street and uh, started a hedge fund, and he is now a billionaire this is a kid who did not grow up with a lot of money and he's a billionaire and so he lives in new york and he came to la and he's like uh he's like let's go to dinner and i said great and uh i i said where do you want to go and he goes let's try that place felix and so i tried to get reservation like three different ways couldn't get one and then i told him we can't get one but i got a reservation somewhere else and then he called me back like seven minutes later he's like i got us a table at 6 30 Saturday night. I'm like, how the fuck did you do that? He's like, I'm a billionaire. <laughs> I mean, like, what does he and tell them? And then he them? split like, the check with me. Split no, the didn't. fucking check. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. Do you think he called? Because like, even if you're a billionaire, do you call and say like, hey, listen, I'm going to, just so you know, I'm going to spend, I'm, I'm a foodie and I'm successful. I'm going to spend at least $500. You know, we should do that story. There's, there's, there's a, there's an app that is about how much money you have, and it prioritizes reservations. I, I, I'm not making this up. I think I saw it somewhere, I read it somewhere this week. So anyway, yeah. we can look, yeah, let's look into that. But uh, listen, what we should recommend to this guy is Scopa is maybe my favorite restaurant on the west side. It's so loud, though. It's a big place, but it's lively, full bar, homemade pasta is great. Now, comfort, if you just want a comfortable, amazing place with strong drinks and great burgers and pasta and basic comfort food, I mean, we love the galley. Yeah, the galley's fun, and it's, a, and it's like Monica. a real West Side uh, staple. It's got a lot of character, a lot of locals. ish yeah. A lot of locals go there every night. They sit at the bar. It's the kind of place where you can strike up a conversation with anybody, and it's decorated with Christmas lights year-round. Yep, Shay J's a kind of similar vibe, although they've gotten a bit trendy. Yeah. Um, all right, let's do one more. Uh, okay. This is from Ray, who identifies as a he, him from Toronto. I Thanks think if clarifying. you live in Toronto, you're kind of a he, she, because the men in Canada are kind of soft. Okay. 
I'm a fiction writer who's had minor success with local contests. I don't know what that means. A lifetime ago and gotten some whiffs of interest, a whiff of interest with screenplays and TV show pitching in decades past, but I haven't made a sale yet, let alone approaching being able to make a career by writing. What would your advice be for trying to break into writing for the movie or TV industry? Contests, if so, which ones? Trying to land an agent. I'm happy to do the writing and legwork, but want to make the best use of time and effort to get some traction somewhere, anywhere. Uh, well, first of all, change from he, him to she, he, him to a she, her uh, immediately. Oh, uh, man, I don't know. Maybe change to a they, it? Yes. Do a, a thon, they, it. A thon, thus. Yeah. Um, no, but in all seriousness, uh, the best thing you can do if you live in Canada is come up with a way to get your writing in front of people. Because number one, it'll force you to write. And the more you write, the better you're going to get at writing. And number two, you don't have to wait for somebody to say yes. You can start to put out essays, funny tweets, uh, figure out what your strength is. And, you know, you can write blogs. Blog writing still exists. There's plenty of people that have um, big followings on, what's the name of the app that people write sort of blogs on still? Tumblr? Yeah, maybe it's Tumblr. <laughs> and what? No, it, it is. Is it Tumblr? Didn't Facebook put them all out of business? I don't know. I don't know. But find your medium on social media and put stuff out. Build up a following. And then uh, you will be in a position then to reach out to an agency and say, look, I've got some critical mass. I've got people. I've got a body of work. Um, it's very hard to just write a script and send it to an agency when you live in Canada and expect them to pay much attention to it. Um, Not with this idea. I'm gonna give. I'm gonna give real concrete advice to right, uh, to Ray. Uh, so we talked about Coda. Here's the idea for a movie. Uh, Coba, children of blind adults. So you just take Coda, which was about deaf people, and you make it about blind people. It's a comedy. <laughs> it's like a. It's a, it's a very funny. They're all bumping into each other. Uh -huh. I, I mean, do I have to? It writes itself. In fact, just. Don't even just stay out of its way. It's going to write itself and then submit that everywhere you can. And I, you're, you're going to be nominated. You're going to be one of the 40 films that's nominated next year. Um, Chris Denman writes in from St. Louis, the hotbed of entertainment that it is. They have government money that has to be spent on entertainment, pitch for grants. That's actually legit. You can, and I'm sure Canada has it, uh, you know, find a way to do it that way, I guess. I mean... I, I don't know why I'm thinking about Hollywood. I mean, Jesus, Canada's got a thriving movie and TV industry. I mean, what was that show that uh, that was big last year set in the motel, The Family That Loses All Their Money? Schitt's Creek? Schitt's Creek. Started as a Canadian broadcasting show. Okay, another, move, another movie idea. Canadian Bacon. It's, it's autobiographical. You have this amazing title called Canadian Bacon, and you kidnap... Uh, what's his name? Kevin Bacon. And you d force him to do this movie and you have him in Toronto in some cellar tied up and gagged. Again, it writes itself. Just stay out of its way. I love it. I Canadian love it. Bacon. Nice of Mike to take this opportunity as a seasoned writer and impart real wisdom to people that are trying to follow their dreams. Nice, now Mike. Now you can see why I'm so busy. Uh, letters to the editor. This is different section. Are we doing yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Let's do that. All right. I don't have any more movie ideas, so I hope they're not asking. Charles McLennan says, as for your doctor visit, I was talking for a very short time to a nurse that... Did I talk about my proctology exam on last week's Too episode? much. <laughs> Too much. Uh, uh, I talked to a nurse that worked for a proctologist. She said that a preacher was in for a hemorrhoid surgery and she had to put two fingers in his ass and spread them apart for the doctor to work. As she moved her fingers around throughout the surgery, the preacher got hard and actually came. Mm. So he was really into butt play or it's super good. I know from teaching women to have anal sex once I got them to orgasm that way. Anal sex is the main way they want sex afterwards. <laughs> Wait, what is this? <laughs> I even had a girlfriend that broke up 
with keep emailing me. Uh, he he devolves off into. I think he's a crazy person, and I I don't know that this preacher really orgasmed from hemorrhoid surgery. I don't know that that's true. All right. Well, I want to go back to the first line. As for your doctor visit, I was <laughs> I was talking for a very short time to a nurse. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I imagine right <laughs> I imagine based on the rest of your letter that that was a very short conversation. <laughs> Hi, nice to meet you. Oh, what do you do? Uh, I work for a proctologist. Has anyone ever come while you stuck the fingers? Over the- yeah, I got a roll. Really nice meeting you. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> um, all right. Let's get down to the obituary this week. Yep. Here we go. And that's all, folks. Robert Blake, the Emmy Award-winning performer who went from acclaim for his acting to notoriety when he was tried and acquitted of murdering his wife. He died Thursday at age 89. Uh, He died from heart disease, star of 1970s TV show Beretta. Were you Mm -hmm. a Beretta fan? Not really, but I mean, it was every, I mean, there was only three channels, you know, and he had that parrot, the white parrot on his, you know, yep. in his apartment. And he always Tough like- Tough talking cop. Yeah, I think he cracked nuts a lot. And uh, and I, yeah. by that, I mean, he busted balls. Yep. Um, but it, it was, it's true. There was three channels back then. So even if you weren't a fan of a show, you watched it because it was, it was on. Yeah. yeah. Whether it was Kojak or Beretta- or, you know, uh, Hill Street Blues. We all watch the same shows. So um, he never recovered from the long ordeal, which began with the shooting death of his wife, Bonnie Lee Bakley, outside a Studio City, a re- Studio City restaurant in 2001. Uh, the story of their strange marriage, the child it produced, and its violent end was a Hollywood tragedy played out in court. Hey, maybe the Canadian guy can write this screenplay. Canadian Blaken. I'm on fire. So he uh, he was adamant he had not killed his wife. He was acquitted, but he was liable for her death in order to pay Bakley's family $30 million, a judgment that sent him into bankruptcy. So um, he wow, started yeah. out in, in our gang comedies and acted oh, yeah, in a child movie. Child actor, child actor. He was they a child turn actor. Out great. Yeah. He was in Drew McCapote's In Cold Blood. Yep, he might have been nominated for that. Um, he won the seventy-five Emmy. That's correct. And uh, uh, he was apparently a. Oh. There was a lot of disputes because he was a temperamental star. He was very difficult to work with, and so he didn't work a lot later in life. Um, born to Italian immigrants in New Jersey, and. Uh, but where's the stuff about the murder of the wife? He's a tough psychopath. Well, you know, he, uh, what happened vaguely, I remember, is he, uh, they ate at a restaurant together. He then, <laughs> this is, trust me, you'll think I get these details wrong, but the, this is how it happened. He then parked in the alley behind the restaurant because he forgot his gun in the restaurant. He went into the restaurant. I believe this is, I have this right. Vitello's. Uh, yeah, Vitello's. And when he came out, she had been killed. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, uh, I remember at the time, you know, you look to these comedy greats to just cut through everything and get to the most logical thing. And Gary Shandling said, uh, he he's totally guilty because, because you know, well, the, the court found him not guilty. Uh, the, he goes, because here's the deal. You hate your wife. You really hate her. You talk about how much you hate her. You also talk about wishing she were dead. You want your wife dead. You go back into the restaurant to get some, you come out and she's dead. No one is that lucky. <laughs> <laughs> like what a coincidence. There was also a weird story where she had a, baby girl she named christian brando son of marlon and she said that christian brando uh was the uh, father of the child but dna test pointed to blake yeah yeah, yeah. so he, he had quite a life quite a life i hope 
I hope I have an obituary as interesting as that when I die. He was a punchline or part of a punchline in Anchorman 2 last night. Was he? Yep. Wow. So I heard his name just last night. Damn. Um, all right. Let's get to the funnies. Sunday funnies. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this week we got uh, Dilbert. We got a Dilbert strip, a new one. You want to read it? Uh, so wait, are we going to talk about this? No, let's just read it. All right, well, uh, Dilbert walks into the conference room, um, and it looks like there's uh, an African-American woman, and she has uh, the uh, dry erase marker in her hand, and Dilbert's like, Carol... Why do you have that marker in your hand? That's a whiteboard. <laughs> now, are we going to explain this? Um, yeah, those are for good. Those are for good ideas from white people, Carol. It's a whites only board. I mean, I think that's what he's trying to say. <laughs> All right, let's get down to Hagger the Horrible. Wait a minute. Wait, okay. Wait, all right. I think we have to have a podcast meeting. I think you just hung me out to dry. <laughs> no, what's the guy's? All right, we that Dickie. was our fr our friend Dicky. Yeah, Richard Egan, as his brother calls him. Uh, right. He said maybe we should make up our own Dilbert cartoon. So each week we're going to make up a Dilbert cartoon. Uh, so the the cartoonist got in trouble, right, for racially insensitive material. Is that do I have that right? Yes. His name. All was, right. What was the name Charles something? So we are. So we coughed that one up pretty quickly, uh, right as we were pressing record <laughs> at the beginning of this podcast, and uh, I don't know how that came out. It's all my ideas. It doesn't involve Kevin Bacon or Canada, but I, I'm loaded with ideas today. And uh, so we're trying to write in his voice. That's a fair way of saying it. Yeah. All right. This is Thank from... Thank you, Dickie, for the idea. This sure is a letter proud. I got from a woman who calls herself a real-life blondie babe. She said, I'm a longtime listener of all of yours. Oh, wait a second. Just got a text from the Sklar brothers. Right. And they said, out of... We're out of town, but thank you, sweet boy. May the luck. Uh, we know that's that's. Uh, <laughs> they, wait a minute. Are they stealing? Uh, what's his name's material? Ho yeah, Pete Holmes. Yeah, yeah, Hollywood has gotten together to come up with a a rubber stamp. <laughs> no, to my my Irish St. Patrick's Day show. Sorry, no. sweet boy. I'm out of town. Randy Sklar said, "Ah, shit. I'm in Joshua Tree. Fuck. Sorry, Fitzy." Okay. Oh, nice. So they won't be there. Uh, so she said, I'm a longtime listener of yours and Allison's podcast. You two are my faves and a good influence on my life. You two help me realize I want a family and want a happy marriage. You talk about your family in a way that not a lot of people get to witness in real life, and it helps me realize pursuing a family with the right person is worth it. In particular, hmm. your rants in Sunday papers about Blondie and Dagwood have really spoke to me. Have really spoken or spoke to me? Don't correct her. Keep reading. I, I am Blondie, and I have finally uprooted my life from a Dagwood. Sometimes mm. it's very easy to forgive an unsatisfying life with someone because life is just hard these last few years. But for those same few years, I heard you talk mad shit about Dagwood and even listen to these rants with my Dagwood and secretly hoped they would speak to him. But apparently they only spoke to me. Thank you mm. for taking the shit that no one else in my life would have said to me but needed to be called out. Life is starting to feel better. How about talking that? the shit, I think she said. Talking the shit that no one else in her life would have said Oh, to her. talking the shit, yeah. Yeah, all right. Changing lives on Sunday papers. And there's no picture with this letter? There is no picture. Nope. Uh, she says she's a real-life blondie, but uh, maybe she could send a photo. <laughs> and we can decide. And right. include the calves. Make sure the calves are in the shot. Well, next listen, week, we're very next happy week we're for get you. Get a letter from uh, Dagwood. I mean, look, it's a very tough thing when you get married. And you literally say on the altar that this is for life. It is a legal contract forever, and so you can get trapped into feeling life there, like there is no choice. And maybe sometimes you're in a relationship where the person you're with is. 
you know, there's different levels of calling someone abusive, but to to be unemotional and make you feel alone. I mean, that's no way to go through life. So I'm I'm happy for you that you realize that this guy is a a sandwich eating, low self esteem, mid level manager who doesn't make love to you when there's a when there's a nap to be had. So good for you. Better to be alone and happy than uh, with someone and unhappy. And alone doesn't mean lonely. You were alone for a, a bunch of years after your divorce, and you were uh, lonely. You, 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 no, <laughs> no, you were, you were okay. No, I was totally okay. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah. No, that marriage uh, sl- slowly came to an end, and there were no surprises, so that's good. Um, and yeah, no, it's it's, and I, I don't know. Hopefully, as you get older, you realize, you know, you realize, without being selfish about it, you gotta you gotta look out for your own happiness m- more than. It took me a while to learn that, you know, mm. uh, and so. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, listen speaking I've had of ha- so many good ideas, I'm running on empty now. Speaking of happily married couples, here's a Hager and Helga sitting on the on the couch together and they're arm in arm and they're smiling. They do look happy. They look very happy. They are having some cuddle session, some medieval cuddle session on the couch. And he goes, you're the only one for me, Helga. Why, even if Lady Godiva rode through our front door, I wouldn't give her a second look. And Helga goes, how long would the first look last? And And he's like, I don't look at him when I rape him. (laughs) I go by feel. I'm old school. Why would I want to see that? I just get sad when I look at the fear in their eyes. Boner killer. (laughs) (laughs) You don't want a boner killer during a rape. Yeah, tell me that Lady Godiva would not have gotten raped. That was not a true story. She would have been raped instantly in those days. I don't know anything about Lady Godiva. Neither do I. All right, here comes the far side. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, man. All right, I'll look up. When you're doing Blondie, I'll look up who sent this in. But this was sent in, and I, I love it. I remember this one vividly. So it's a two-parter. They're on top of each other in, in this frame of the far side. And the guy, this guy is reading a letter, and it's crudely, the handwriting is very crude, and it says, Master, and like the S is backwards, and it's like, Me and Rex took the car, K-A-R, to town. Stay home, exclamation point. Stay, <laughs> exclamation points. Ha, 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 the dog. And then you see underneath two dogs just joyriding in a car. <laughs> but the stay, ha, 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 like that they get it is so stay. funny to me. Yeah, I always That's love a that fucking one. fucking great one. Oh, it's really great. Uh, and now here she is, the woman who is in a stalled out marriage, who, who unlike our, our listener, has not gotten off her ass and freed herself. Uh, Shitface comes home from work. He's got on a blue, light blue trench coat, which I've never seen on a man. And she goes, uh, how did Employee Appreciation Day go? And he goes, the boss outdid himself. We got free coffee all day. And the boss even gave me a fist bump. You fucking low expectation having piece of shit. And then she kisses him and goes, wow, he really raised the bar this year. Is he a mentally challenged human being? <laughs> It's like he expects nothing and you're encouraging this. She, I think she could do better is what you've been saying. I think a podcaster who comes to you from different cities around the country every Sunday because he's traveling around spreading mirth. That would be it. That would be a man for you. Yeah. I have no boss. I don't have a boss. That's the best thing about my life. We have you're no pedal- boss. You're peddling pins all over the country? Peddling pins, baby. She would love it. And she'd be wearing one. And in, 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 in this cartoon, she'd have Fitz Dog pins all over her big tits. <laughs> it was Timothy Kane who sent in that far side. Oh, thank there you, you, Timothy. Go. Very nice. And thank you also to the Midcoast media people that make the show happen every week. Yeah. Uh, 
Thank you, guys. You're the best, and thanks for producing the show. April 1st, we'll be coming to you in St. Louis. Also, don't forget about Green Chef. Right now, you can go to greenchef.com slash paper60. Use paper code paper60 and get 60% off plus free shipping. We know you'll love it. We love it. And uh, and that should pretty much do it. We'll be I'll be back in L.A. next weekend. And we'll be doing the show. What do you think about this idea, Mike Gibbons? I'm an idea factory. Go ahead, Greg. What if we got together in the studio and did Sunday Papers next week and see how it goes? Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I don't like it, but uh, I, I think we don't. should tr- I, maybe we try it. Let's try it. Let's try it and see how it feels. And that's going to be. Oh, yeah. We have to figure out some scheduling. Uh, may I don't know what what the the show's Friday night. Is the show show's Friday, Friday night? night? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're thinking Saturday morning? Yeah. All right. All right. Good. We'll talk All right. About listen, the show. everybody. Yeah. You've 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 literally seen the full extent of our production meetings and conversations <laughs> about the show. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, we love you guys, and we'll see you next week. Take it ish. Take it ish. Every day, every Sunday. This might sound old.